So my Fridays, final Friday for this month, um, the storyteller's voice is with Christy Browning. I'm going to share her bio. This enthusiastic, interactive, and relevant speaker shares her special, her personal experiences of faith and life principles, which she has gained after persevering through divorce, bankruptcy, a miscarriage, destroyed and destructive relationships, approval addiction, lack of identity and sense of self, and business loss. But... Her story's not over. It was during the, a two-year prison sentence that she began to rebuild her life, understand her calling, and embrace the authentic and empowered life she was meant to live. Welcome, Christy Browning. What's up, lady? Thank you. Thank you. Wow. That's a mouthful. Well, I'm just glad the second half of the bio exists. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's awesome. And um, so, Christy, I have read your bio, but tell me in your own words, who's Christy Browning? So, you know, I got into, um, into some trouble, hence the two-year prison sentence. But it was not a path that you would expect to have seen from me, from my past, from where I came from. It wasn't a, a youthful indiscretion that got me there. I was well into my adult life when I ended up there, but I was born and raised in a faith-based home with two loving parents that always encouraged me and supported me, um, gave me opportunity. I could have done anything, been anything, but you know, it doesn't take very long for us to start to slip out of what our purpose is when we don't stay tied into truth into positivity and into the things that really matter most to us. And I, step by step, you know, decision by decision, really walked away from, I think, what was true and what I was really raised in um, and woke up one day and realized that I was a little too far gone. Um, and all of those things that you read in the bio that I that I went through, that I experienced, you know, they didn't just happen overnight. It was a series of poor decisions or setbacks or disappointments I didn't bounce back from. But that prison sentence changed my life. It was the hardest time of my life, but it was the most transformative time of my life. And I told myself about halfway through, I was not going to leave that prison yard, the same Christie that went into it. And by the grace of God, it was it was a different story yeah, when I came home. He's allowing you to rewrite your story. Yeah. Even as I'm sitting here listening to you, I'm hearing your part of it. But you know whose part I would really love to hear? <laughs> your parents. Oh, man. Wow. <laughs> they, because you have to be grounded in faith. Life happens. You know what I mean? Yes. And so you have to be grounded in faith to even um, withstand a child going through some things. Yeah. Such as that. It was really hard on them. I know they've shared some of that with me personally, but, you know, from their perspective, I can't even imagine. Um, they live in Tennessee where I was born and raised. Um, I was in Indiana when I was serving my time. And I'm sure it took everything within them to not get in the car and burst through walls and break through gates to, you know, get their baby girl out of there or fix it. But they were... Um, they were so good at balancing grace and space mm. and realizing that this was something I had to work out. They couldn't fix me. Um, they had to let me do it. Um, and I know many times we would be on the phone and my dad would try to speak wisdom into me. And, you know, I'm sure at the time he thought it just bounced right off of me. And in the moment, it really did. But there was a time sitting in that prison cell, what all started to ring true. Um, there was a part I blamed them for a lot of it as well. And our relationship really took some dings and some hits. Um, but again, you know, because of God and his forgiveness, we were able to repair that relationship. And it's all the better for it today. That's amazing. There's a story, and I don't want to get off topic, of Lynn and Kathy Mink. Are you familiar with them? I'm not. Oh, they are uh, a spiritual fa um, husband and wife who actually teach on TBN. Mm. And they tell a very similar story about their son. Um, so that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So do you wrestle with your story, though? Oh, every single day. It's um, not something you can run away from. 
Um, the label felon exists no matter what you do, where you go. Um, for instance, my husband and I were just kind of dreaming about a, a cruise or a vacation, you know, and I think, I don't want to dream too big about that because I have a felon what if they, or a felony. What if they don't approve me for a passport? You know, it's just that reality everyday thing mm-hmm. that really impacts. And so there's part of me that wants so bad to be the conquering hero of that. But then there's parts of life that just quickly remind you that it's still there. And that's the battle because it's not a one and done. It wasn't just one decision made there at prison and then it was all good from there. It is truly an everyday decision to let that be something that shaded me but doesn't shape me. What personal details of um, do you wrestle with? That is one yeah. that stands right out front. Um, anything related to what you do as a speaker? So part of it is that vulnerability of stepping on stage and, you know, someone's invited you to come speak to their audience and you hope that they see you as today and what you went through. Um, You don't want them to automatically just throw you in the box as a felon and then treat you differently. So there's that vulnerability of what if they don't accept the new me, the transformed me. Um, That was a lot of a vulnerability in writing my story or anytime I put it on a blog post or speak it out loud. It's what if someone rejects me or won't accept me or won't look at me the same. Um, that's hard. It takes a lot of courage to do that. And especially like here in Fort Wayne where people know me, know me, you know, it's not like going to a city where I will never see those people again, you know, may not ever see them again here. This is my hometown. So, you know, I'll run into someone on the street or at my place of work or at church, you know, and they know my story. There's no running from that. And you have to really be able to stand in it. And even if they don't get it, and there are some people who definitely voice it if they don't get it, I have to stand there and realize what's true. And I know who I am and who changed me. And, and what the walk truth in is. your truth. Yes, yes, yes. Because none of us are are, are perfect. Mm-hmm. We're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you, um, looking at your story online is what pulled me in even closer <laughs> Um, to say, look at where she was and look at where she is. So that's powerful. Yeah, and that's really my message now. It's not to glorify my mistakes or to um, diminish the importance of doing what's right and, and the fact that I had to pay those consequences. It really is wanting to share this message of being a revised person, that we can change our lives. We can make a decision today to rewrite our future. And yes, our past exists, but it doesn't have to be what what holds us back and keeps us kept away from success or greatness or purpose. It can be the very thing we need to bring out into the light to give us purpose, to give us significance. And that's what I really want to encourage others to do with their stories. So is that where the title revision comes from? Absolutely. Uh. Absolutely. I fell in love with the concept that what was written in ink, God could white out. (laughs) What was what I had written on my heart, he could overwrite it and put something else new there. And so I really, really attached to that word revise and revision. There you go. How'd you meet your current husband? (laughs) Oh, man, I am so lucky to have this man in my life. He is amazing. And he's the perfect balance for me when I get too serious. He's the first person to make me laugh. And when I want to drive off the deep end on some crazy idea, he keeps me grounded. And What's he's his name? such a great support system. His name is Matt. And Matt and I actually met through online dating. Um, we're a Match.com success history story. So they should like totally put us on their commercials <laughs> because it worked for us. And um, he just was such an answer to prayer that I didn't even know I was praying for, honestly. It really wasn't necessarily looking for the one. But, but he came into my life and I couldn't say no. He's your yin and you're the yin and yang. Totally, huh? totally. <laughs> Do you have children? So I don't have children of my own, but when I met Matt and married him, I got two stepchildren. I have a stepdaughter um, who's 20 and a stepson who's 17. And so that was a whole transition, not only being married again, but all of a sudden being an instant mom and I had no idea what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing, but <laughs> thank goodness they love me enough to, to give me some space and grace on that. <laughs> What are their names? So Jalen is 17 and Felicity is uh, my stepdaughter. Um, and and they're just, they're fun. You know, it's it's a fun experience. And um, my stepson lives with us at home. Um, he's just like his dad. So I'm highly outnumbered in the household. <laughs> but 
it's never a dull moment they're fun you keep you have two grounds then yeah they keep you grounded he keeps me humble because Ah. he will remind me real fast you know (laughs) (laughs) when i don't do something right just to kind of you know pull up my chain and joke around with me (laughs) that's cool they're great (laughs) so as um the author of my author of the month for march um talk let's talk about the books that you've written So I actually started writing books um, more on a professional basis. I wrote two books um, on business, um, one revolving around time management and how to get a grip on managing your time, um, specifically writing to women who were maybe wanting to launch a business, but always working full time and feeling pulled from wanting to really launch this business. Um, And that came out of my own personal experience because I struggled with that too. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote a money management book um, for business women but I just really felt like the message was bigger than just business. And um, I started really looking at my own past and I found that this whole concept of approval addiction really lived in me and I noticed it in other women as well, especially. Um, And the only way I could fix that was going to scripture and and researching truth. And when I kind of started uncovering that, I thought "This, this has to be something I teach someone in a book. What is that? So the name of that book is called No Approval Necessary. No, what is approval addiction? Oh, approval addiction is um, when you want to alter who you are, what you do, or what you want in life Mm -hmm. in order to gain the approval or pleasure or applause from other people. And I was severely addicted to that. That's what drove everything about me as a young adult. Um, And really it's what drove me to make some really poor decisions because I was so worried about what everyone else wanted that I didn't really think about what was right or what God wanted for me for Mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that book was a lot about helping people recover from approval addiction, but a little bit about my story. And after that went out, I just thought, people needed to hear the story. They needed to know all the facts. And so um, in January, I released my latest book called Repeatedly Revise, um, learning to start over again and again. And really, it could say and again and again and again and again, because that's truly life. Is that what you're going to read an excerpt? I will read an excerpt from this latest release. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's no way to sugarcoat it. I was guilty. I sat in a courtroom where a jury found me guilty of fraud. The courtroom scene was not nearly as dramatic as what plays out on primetime television, but that didn't diminish the feeling that hit when I heard the words, guilty. It was as if someone kicked me in the gut, forcing all the air out of my lungs. I was guilty according to this jury that was selected for my trial, guilty of fraud, and I was now going to face jail time. What the judge said afterwards met my ears coated in a heavy fog. Not much made sense and not much penetrated my mind. As I tried to stand up from my place at the defendant's table, my legs moved as if there were large weights attached to my ankles. I remember trying to be polite as I conversed with my attorney, trying to absorb her direction, but nothing soaked in. All I knew was that I would be coming back to that very seat and in that very courtroom in a month to be sentenced for the crime in which I was just found guilty of. I'm not sure how you're supposed to function during that 30-day waiting period from the time you're found guilty to the time you're sentenced. The judge said it was time for me to get my affairs in order, but I didn't know what that meant exactly. I went about working, cleaning my house, going to church, preparing meals, grocery shopping, all the things that a normal life would include. However, everything I did and all the plans I made had an expiration date. My trial came and went with the same day. Jury selection started off the morning of, and by mid-morning, questions were being hurled at the witness stand. There wasn't anyone in the courtroom outside of the major players. No audience had come to watch the drama unfold. And by late afternoon, the jury was back with their verdict, and everyone was home having dinner like any other night, but not me. I sat at my dinner table knowing that in a month, I would find out what my punishment would be and how that might impact the rest of my life. My charge was classified as a Class D felony for fraud, and that was a vague description of the crimes painted during my trial. My character, my ethics, and even my faith were called into question. In the end, my case centered around mishandled funds that equaled less than $600. I sat in the courtroom trying to focus on what was being said but by the attorneys and the witnesses. The process was so full of legal jargon and fast-paced action that most of that day went by in a blur, but what I can't forget were the comments and the remarks that stung and cut me deep. The day was emotional, exhausting, and overwhelming. That's intense. 
It was an intense day, an intense two years that followed. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's almost hard to read that out loud. It without is. Without feeling, feeling an emotional, emotion. you know, pull from that. And that was probably one of the hardest things about writing the book was having to step back in time and relive all of those moments in order to graphically put them on paper. There were a lot of tears shed across the keyboard of my laptop um, because it was a very real experience to put that back on paper. I'll I'll bet also in writing it that made you even more humble to where you are now. Yes. And there's so much that didn't go in the book that you know, I remembered or I could have included, um, I kept a very detailed journal while I was in prison. And so that's where part of the book is is written out of and part of my journal entries are included in the book. And so to read through that really puts me back into that space and into that place. Um, That's, that's, it's very humbling. So now will you go in and, and, and write more details, write another book with that journal? Yeah, so it's funny because I worked so hard to get this done and sent it off to be printed and, and I get it back and I read through it and I want to rip it apart and do it all over again because, you know, a perfectionist is oh, never okay. is never satisfied. Okay. <laughs> so what I do think will probably happen is maybe a second edition of this project will come back out. So the book ends with where I meet Matt and so I plan oh. to do a follow-up um, book called Live Revised that is a little bit more of the story after the fact, but also will encourage readers to make their own revision to their life. And it'll be a little bit more practical application to how they can do that for themselves. Very cool. So now you have four books. Mm-hmm. Tell us about um, the titles of them and where can they be obtained? Sure. Mm-hmm. So um, Kicking the Clock is the time management book. Um, And you can purchase all four books on Amazon.com. And you can also find them on my personal website, ChristyBrowning.com. So Kick the Clock is on time management. Refocus on money is the money book for business women. No Approval Necessary is the Bible study book on approval addiction. And then Repeatedly Revised is the latest release. Beautiful. Are you traditionally published or self-published? So I opted to self-publish. Um, part of the reason was that I wanted to have complete control. Not only my perfectionist, I'm a little bit of a control freak, and so <laughs> I didn't want to let go of anything. Um, but also I wanted the capacity to take what I was producing with me to events, to opportunities like this, and be able to share that without having a publisher saying yes or no and what I could and couldn't ah. do with it. Um, and then it's hard to go traditional publishing. You have to pound the pavement for a very long time to get someone who wants to represent present your book and then, you know, showcase it off to publishers. And I was impatient. I didn't want to wait for someone to buy into my message. I already knew it was valid and I wanted to get it out there. And so the self-publishing opportunity is is really vast now with technology. And if you can learn a little bit about a couple of platforms, you have the opportunity to do that. And there was no stopping me once I figured that out. And um, that's pretty cool because this process of um, Final Fridays interviewing the authors, um, I get different different feedback, but many more people are doing the self-publishing route um, because of the same thing. Mm-hmm. Many different reasons, but one is because they have complete control of it. Yeah, and I wanted to have a, an affordable way to put a tangible product in my hand. And um, with options uh, like CreateSpace or... Um, Kindle Direct Publishing, you can just purchase one book if that's all you want. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to buy mass quantities. It fits your budget. Um, They do all the heavy lifting as far as getting you onto Amazon.com and producing an ebook if you want that option. So it's never been a better time for someone to decide they want to put out their own message or their own book or story. Um, There's just a lot of opportunities for us now. Sounds like tons of benefits with that way. Yes. Are there any, in your eyes, um, negatives with self-publishing? So with self-publishing, you kind of have to know the tech part of it. There is a little bit of a learning curve on how to format your transcript and create a cover and you know upload it to a site and then make that technology work for you. Um, but what I have found with like Kindle Direct, there are aspects of that that you can purchase services from them to help you with some of that. Um, they provide some editing services if you want to buy into that. Um, there's also really great videos that you can watch, simple YouTube videos that can show you how to utilize those 
those those platforms and if you're willing to learn and just kind of give it a try you can usually teach yourself those platforms and there's no cost to upload the stuff so even if you upload it and you don't ever do anything with it you've at least learned you know how to do it um that's part of the reason why my first book was was just a small business book because i thought i want to know what this is first and really learn it before i come out with something like my own personal story and so looking back now that first book i would have done it a little differently having done it now four times and really understanding how that process works but it's totally doable it's totally possible and if you're not willing to to just sit and learn all that stuff there's a million people in the wings who will do that tech part for you Mm -hmm. Um, so there's lots of independent freelance uh, people who can provide graphic art design for you for a book cover or provide some um, written language for the back jacket all that stuff is available now for us very cool so for a new um, writer who's looking to publish what's a, a couple steps that you would give them? So first I would say just get writing. Don't let the technology hold you back. Open up the laptop or grab the pad of paper and just start putting something on paper. You can't edit an empty page and you can't upload an empty page. You've got to have content. So don't wait for you to know it all or to have it all. Just start writing. And I find that when you start to create that product, you get a little more motivated to push yourself out to learn more, do more, experience these platforms. Um, it becomes maybe what's more forefront of your mind. So you start to pick up on opportunities, people who can help you that you may have just passed by and never thought of. Um, you start looking for ways to connect with other people. And that just opens the floodgates, I think, for for us. So definitely just get started and then ask questions. You know, don't be afraid to ask for resources. I think Fort Wayne's really lucky that we have um, a a variety of of types of people in our community Mm -hmm. that know how to do stuff, whether it's graphic arts or photos or writing or editing. And so, you know, resources like the library is great and just being able to find people who can help you with those aspects. Um, So just start and ask lots of questions and be willing to learn. Good. Good advice. Thanks. Let's talk about the speaking and the writing. How do you connect the two? So for me, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. I just don't think one can (laughs) exist without the other. And possibly that's because I've never known when to shut up. (laughs) (laughs) I've never had a loss for something to say. Um, But I feel like, you know, there's there's a part of me that can be conveyed in written word And that's cool because people can sit with that and absorb that at their pace. But then there's a part of me that you can only really appreciate if you hear me say it. (laughs) I had someone once tell me that when I come on stage to speak, I'm like a tsunami and this big personality that kind of comes on. At least that's the way I took it. I I think they meant it as a compliment. I I chose to accept it as a compliment. But there is just part of me that can only really be conveyed in that way. Um, And that may not be for everybody, but it's what works for me. And I enjoy the speaking part almost just as much as the writing sometimes they they flip flop in first and second place okay but I find I can speak faster than I can write so sometimes I do like the speaking better um, and it's a lot more fun to interact with a live audience than to sit in your pjs in front of your laptop and not have anybody responding Talk to, to the anything computer. exactly <laughs> my dogs are great audiences but that's about it you know so um, they do work hand in hand but I think it's really powerful for a writer to st- take that step forward and and do the speaking part too because there's opportunities to um, introduce your work even if it's not you know speaking on a different platform or speaking on an expanded platform just to share your work with an audience um, you know is is powerful and we're such a visual and audio driven society now um, I think that's where you're going to capture readership in a big way is if you can learn how to vocalize that. So you stepping in front of an audience has never been a uh something that made you uncomfortable or nervous no in fact there's been many of the hooks that have yanked me off stage (laughs) saying okay christy enough's enough uh no but i was introduced to stage at a really young age my my dad was a musician and played um, instruments in our church and he frequently would bring me on stage to sing on sunday morning and and that just was it. That was the, where it all began. And at I've, age three. At age like three and four, <laughs> I could barely pronounce the words, you know. Uh, I was up there doing it. And my first like real speaking thing happened on a whim. Actually, I was at a, a church camp with probably about 
thousand or so teenagers and they wanted someone that night at the church service to give their testimony and one of the leaders asked me if I would do it and I was so excited I thought oh yeah this is totally (laughs) for me and my mom and dad happened to be counselors with our youth group at the camp and I remember telling my mom that I was going to do it and she was like sweetheart I can get you out of this if you don't want to do it she was so nervous (laughs) for me and I think she was was ready to go I was like no way let me do it and so that kind of started it from there that's cool very cool (laughs) well you said one-on-one it was a little bit different but no you actually are right in the one-on-one space too (laughs) so that's awesome um talk to us about the social media are you social media savvy yeah yeah and how did that happen and how do you build your um, readership with that Mm. so the social media part of that um really was a self-taught thing it was something i knew was happening was growing was where everyone was starting to pull their information and their social connections and i knew if i was going to be relevant whether it was in another business or as a speaker writer like that had to be it I had to learn that Mm -hmm. and so um, I just became a voracious learner of it Um, I subscribed to a ton of webinars read a ton of ebooks anybody who would give me some free information I would soak it up and um, that was my training ground and I just a lot of trial and error a lot of trial and error and the great thing about social media is nothing lasts very long. There's always something else exciting coming five seconds later. So, you know, if the post wasn't perfect, who cares? Because there will be something else more exciting coming around the corner. And I just went fearlessly into it and have learned how to continue to push forward into the other platforms as they continue to build. And what I have found with that is as a writer and a speaker, we have to recognize that we are business, whether, mm-hmm. you know, we make money at what we do or not. It is a business and every good business has to market themselves. You can't stay quiet and you can't be silent. And so um, as a creative type, it, it would be really easy to sit back and just let someone discover you know, that which you have created, but that's probably not going to happen. Yeah, or it because will happen. there's so much competition out here. Yes. How would they find you? Yes. There's so much noise, you know, in the marketplace. Yes. And so um, becoming intentional about that um, is important. And I've made social media post and content to be something that takes just as much priority as writing a chapter in a book uh-huh. and just really has to go right there with it. And the great thing about writing is it doesn't just have to be a book. When you're writing a Facebook post, hello, you're writing. When you write a blog post, you're writing. Instagram, you're writing. If you are wanting to be a speaker and you do Facebook live videos, you're speaking. And so I kind of look at it like that. And then all of a sudden, it's not something I have to do to market myself. It's just part of what I do. And um, I feel like people are able to connect with me that way. And then they're more inclined to want to you know, follow me at other events or purchase a book or be a part of a webinar or whatever else we may be offering. Because you can be obtained for speaking engagements also, right? Yes, absolutely. How can can you be contacted for that again? Yep. So you can go right to christybrowning.com and there is a spot there for events and how to bring me to whatever event or or conference or seminar, whatever may be going on. Um, And you can just fill out a form right there online and we'll get back to you and make it all happen. Very good. Very good. So there is something special that you have coming up um, April the 13th. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm excited to hear about this. You will be presenting at a TED Talks. Yes. So in case people don't know, Fort Wayne is hosting a TEDx event April 13th. It's happening um, down at the uh, North Manchester campus by Parkview Hospital. And this is several years they've been doing this. So this is not a new thing, but I didn't know about it until last year. So we have to tell people this is really How cool in thing. the world did you get connected to that? So it's really funny. Social media. So hello, we're oh, talking wow. about the importance of this. <laughs> it holds true. So um, I happened to see uh, someone that I follow on social media post about the fact that they need speakers and it was a two-step process to get your name in the ring. Um, the application online I filled out when I was home sick with the flu literally had to prop my iPhone up on the pillow and fill it out because I was that sick so you can't wait for the perfect time you just got to jump in there when opportunity presents itself that's awesome Christy and uh, then we had to submit a video we had to pitch our idea of what our talk would be and I went to submit my video only several weeks after I was in a car accident and so I had black eyes and a scarred up face and I probably looked like I don't even know what in that video and I just had to preface it when I sent it in by 
I'm sorry, the show must go on, <laughs> but I was in a car accident. And here's my video. Uh, so again, you can't wait for things to be perfect. You just got to do it. And so I am so excited. There's uh, 13 of us speakers and we all range from all different kinds of backgrounds, um, all different geographical locations, which is really cool. I didn't realize that so many of the speakers were not going to be from Fort Wayne. So we have people coming from out west, from Dallas, um, I think even a couple from way up oh, north. Wow. So that's really cool for Fort Wayne that all of these people are coming in to talk to our community. And the theme this year is momentum. So it's going to be an inspiring uh, day with a lot of really great ideas to to drive momentum for people. So. And so what are you talking about? Are you, do you have anything? Spe- is it about your journey? Or? A little bit. A little bit. I'm going to be talking about how momentum can be generated from the inside out. And we don't have to wait for something outside of us to make momentum happen. And so a part of that is from my own story. Um, as you can imagine, not a lot of momentum going on in prison. Um, but something had to drive me to this change, to yes. this transformation. And so what does that look like? You know, And how do we generate that when we're in a spot in life whether that's emotionally or figuratively or literally in a spot in life where we don't feel momentum at all. And sometimes we can just just get stuck waiting for it to happen. And when it doesn't happen, with every moment it doesn't happen, we can feel farther and farther away from any point of success or positivity. And so how can we stop the waiting game and really initiate that for ourselves? So I'll be giving four very specific strategic applications that people can apply right away to making that that happen in their lives. And so I am a big TED Talk follower. How <laughs> soon will that be available on on um YouTube. So I think they're going to try to live stream the event that Are day. They really? So um, you can follow the TEDx Fort Wayne event on Facebook so you can get all the updates as well as check out all the other speakers and, and see what they're going to be talking about. Um, and so they'll be posting more information about how you can access all of that. And then each of the speakers um, videos will be up on YouTube. I'm pretty sure within the week. I think that's what they said. Um, so we'll be blasting that out too on social media and sharing that with, Congratulations. with all the followers. So yeah, we're re- oh, wow. I'm really excited. I didn't think about how big of a deal it was until I really got in the room with all the other speakers and I started watching more TED Talks with a different perspective Uh since now I'm going to do one. And I texted my husband at work the other day and said, I'm totally freaking out. This is like the most important 18 minutes of my life. (laughs) What am I doing? How am I going to do this? And so he's like, don't psych yourself out. Just like calm down. Right. So I'm excited. It's going to be a fun day. You'll be awesome. You'll be awesome. And so I wanted to share with you the... um, the listeners on your website there is an awesome six minute six minute and 18 second video that talks about um you being incarcerated and coming out and what's the title of that so that was part of an event called out of the ashes and it was a, a tour that hit a bunch of different cities and it featured a whole bunch of other speakers too and we only all got like six or eight minutes to talk and so somehow I fit two years (laughs) plus in six minutes and 18 seconds Uh, but yes so they can find that there or on YouTube they can search for out of the ashes and and see some of that so very good thank you so much Christy thank you thank you yes yes I'm going to give you the final word so I want to just encourage anyone who's listening one if you're a writer keep writing don't stop even if the the manifestation of that isn't a novel or the great american novel that will change the world it will change someone's world and that's the perspective i think we have to keep in mind Um, and then if you are chasing after any other dream whether it's writing or speaking or creating anything there's a possibility that's there for something bigger and so it's important to keep going after it and whatever needs to change or grow or develop It's worth the time and energy for that to happen because somebody needs whatever it is that you have to offer. Awesome. You are listening to Speak Now with Jenna right here at 95.7 FM, WELT.